we have announced general amnesty for everyone, the security forces from senior to the junior level. And this fear or this hysteria that has taken place is unfounded. Well, that's reassuring. The Taliban 2.0 have swapped their annual spring offensive for a PR offensive and they're giving interviews and press conferences just like a real government. Well, their main aim seems to be to convince people that now they're in charge of Afghanistan, they won't go looking for revenge and will give amnesty to their erstwhile enemies, including Afghan security forces. They've also promised that women will have full rights within the limits of Islamic law. And they've pledged not to allow any terrorist groups to stage attacks from their soil. So can they be trusted? Well, first, you need to know who you're dealing with. The Taliban could not be more pleased. After 20 years of battling, they're back in charge of Afghanistan. Mashallah. Their victory, so sudden, it surprised even them. <laughs> Their first period in power was from the mid-90s to 2001. It was a dark time for many, notable for harsh punishments, oppressiveness and intolerance. <laughs> this time round, they promise things will be different. It's all Taliban 2.0. The group's supreme leader is Haibatullah Akunzada, but it's his deputy, Abdul Ghani Barada, who's become the face of this victory and likely to be Afghanistan's next leader. It was Barada who headed the Taliban's political office in Qatar and handled negotiations with the Americans there. That ultimately led to the US withdrawal agreement. As his forces took Kabul, he preached humility. <laughs> Barada is bolstered by the Taliban's chief PR man, Zabihullah Mujahid, who spent his life hiding from the public gaze. For the past decade, he appeared on TV with his face obscured, but showed himself for the first time at the Taliban's press conference following the fall of Kabul. Again, more reassuring words. We do not have any grudges against anybody. We have pardoned anyone, all those who, have, who had fought against us. We don't want to repeat any conflict, any war again. Very soon, we will be witnessing um, the formation of a strong Islamic and uh, inclusive government. Hard to believe the Taliban is now using words like inclusive, but this is their new approach. And this is their new young face, Abdul Kaha Balki. With a good command of English, he translates for Mujahid and knows how to address a Western audience. Women are a key part of society, and uh, we are guaranteeing all their rights within the limits of Islam. Despite the reassuring words, Western media is full of horrific reports of the Taliban going door to door looking for their enemies, of summary executions and of women being forced to marry or have sex against their will. Newspaper cartoonists are having a field day. No one, they say, really believes the Taliban has changed. And that includes Western politicians and Afghan dissidents. We don't want anybody uh, bilaterally recognizing uh, the Taliban. You believe the Taliban have changed? No. Everyone is scared. We are hopeless. Well, let's hear from our guest now. And in Kabul, we have Obedullah Bahir, who is a lecturer at the American University of Afghanistan. His grandfather, Gulbuddin Hekmatia, was one of Afghanistan's most prominent mujahideen and twice served as prime minister of the country during the 1990s. We're also joined by Madiha Afsal, uh, from the Brookings Institution in Washington. She's an expert on the region and is the author of Pakistan Under Siege, Extremism in Society and the State. Mick Mulroy is a retired CIA officer with 20 years of service, some in Afghanistan, and he was a United States Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense during the Trump administration. And finally, we're joined by Saad Mosseni, the founder of Afghanistan's largest media company, which owns Tolo News. Thank you all for joining us. Much appreciated. Um, Saad Mosseni, I'd like to start with you. Obviously, you have hundreds of staff in the country. Uh, what is happening to them now? It's mixed. Um, some are staying at home. Some have fled. 
uh, some are uh, in the process of fleeing. So we're in a very strange position that uh, we would like to help our people obviously get out if that's uh, what they wish to do. At the same time, we have to keep our operations going. So we've been hiring like crazy the last week. Uh, we've had to like employ people on the Tuesday to appear before the camera on the Wednesday morning with little or zero experience in the media. Are they taking any, uh, so any to, risks to do that? Well, just being in Kabul is a risk uh, for uh, it's a it's a it's a risky be uh, business being an Afghan today, hmm. and uh, there there are no safety nets for anyone. I understand your company is in talks with the Taliban. They've appeared on your programs as well. Have they applied any pressure? Have there been any demands for your media companies to change? No, but only because it's too early. Uh, right now, they're attempting to win hearts and minds and give the impression that they, they are different. And mm. uh, they haven't even formed government. We don't have a cabinet. We don't have a culture minister. I think the restrictions will come later. And you know, for us to determine today or to, uh, mm. to, to figure out what the Taliban will be like is probably too early. You have a number of uh, women presenters and other staff. Have they relayed to you their concerns? Yes, of course. They're, everyone's fearful, everyone's nervous, but they're a pretty stoic, courageous bunch. Uh, they've kept at it, uh, like always. You've said that uh, the, the, the Taliban... Sorry, you've said that the Afghanistan will need decades to recover from this exodus. Perhaps we've seen, what, 80,000 uh, leave the country. What do you mean it will take time to recover? I mean, these people... I mean, look at the folks we've lost. Uh, we have... We invest uh, years in these individuals uh, to build capacity. Um, we've lost journalists, we've lost lecturers, we've lost uh, uh, writers, uh, politicians, bankers. It's going to take us a long time. We, we estimate, I mean, if the figures are anything to go by, that we will end up losing up to 300,000 Afghans just in the next few weeks. Um, and that's a huge, huge loss for the country, this brain drain. Right. What was your... You set up, uh, you know, Mobi Group and Tolo uh, after the invasion, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. What were you trying to do with your company that, you know, may be lost in the future? Well, for us, I mean, it was a new environment, uh, one which allowed uh, free media to prosper. For us, it was just to inform, entertain, to educate. But I think the other role we played was to facilitate social change. And Afghanistan today, not just because of the media, but Afghanistan today is a vastly different country to the one that we, uh, we saw in 2001, majority of which is under the age of 20. Uh, and I think it's going to be very difficult to put that genie back in the bo bottle. Afghans uh, feel different, they're aspirational, they're forward-thinking and forward-looking. Uh, and despite the fact that 300,000 odd people may leave, and perhaps, you know, uh, even a couple of million, but the vast majority will remain in the country. And this Afghanistan is very different to the one that the Taliban ruled last uh, in, in the mid to late 90s. Mm. And does that mean that the Taliban will have to change, as they say they have? Or do you think they will attempt to put the genie back in the bottle? bottle? It's too early to say. I mean... Right. Uh, we, the Taliban have different factions, different individuals. It's not one organization in terms of its uh, uh, the way it will approach things. They have their own. They have their constituency, which is very hardcore. Right. But then they have the political establishment, uh, and some members of which are fairly pragmatic, and others are fairly conservative. So that's... we have to figure out who prevails. Right. Well, that's that's very interesting. Do you have any idea if there is a dichotomy here? Uh, who will have the upper hand going forward? I have no idea. I think that right now we're witnessing this, the behind-the-scenes tug of war between the different factions of the Taliban. Mm. Um, and that's ongoing. I mean, they're obviously very secretive. It's not coming out, but it's obvious that there's something going on. Mick, and um, I beg your pardon. No, I was going to take that point to Mick uh, Mulroy. Uh, you were in the CIA for, for many years. You're still keeping an eye on the situation there. Can you just pick up on that point about the the splits within the Taliban, the differences in, you know, how much they adhere to the old ways and the new ways. Um, is that an exaggeration or is there, is there something there? So I totally agree that it's too early to tell 
exactly what the Taliban's going to be. Uh, you know, I think uh, they know uh, what to say now. That's quite different than in, than in the past. But whether they actually act uh, different is mm. is uh, to be determined. But my guess would be uh, no. I think we've already seen that they're more than willing to use force to take what what they want. Uh, and the only resistance now up in the Panjshir, uh, they're sending forces uh, there right now. We've right. heard uh, many credible reports of atrocities uh, as they came toward Kabul and in Kabul. And I think they, quite frankly, uh, are on the path to be the same Taliban of old. But I also totally agree that Afghanistan is a completely different place than it was before, right. and Kabul especially. Well, we're going to pick up on what's happening in Panjshir which is the exception in Afghanistan right now, uh, a little later in the program. Let me ask you about the head of the CIA, widely reported that he was in Kabul to meet the, uh, the head of the Taliban uh, to, uh, this week. Um, as someone who used to work in the CIA, do you think that was a shrewd move? So, of course, I don't know independently whether he met with uh, the liberator, but uh, I think the media reports are pretty clear, and I think the White House has essentially acknowledged it. So. Um, Oftentimes, uh, the CIA is used to pass sensitive messages, to basically diplomacy, where the, the U.S. is not quite sure whether they want to have a full diplomatic relationship with a government entity. Yeah. Uh, prior to this, we, of course, were negotiating with the Taliban and Mullah Barader, but that was about the withdrawal, specific to the withdrawal. I don't know what the relationship is going to be going forward with the United States. Uh, and perhaps that's why they started this dialogue through the CIA director. All right. You, you mentioned Abdul Ghani Barada a number of times. He was also in our report. He was the one interfacing and dealing with the American diplomats and others in Doha uh, and obviously brokered that agreement with uh, the Trump administration. Do you believe that he is in breach of that deal, the withdrawal deal? So I thought they breached the deal multiple times over. I mean, they've you've used force uh, against civilians. They've done a lot of things that would, I think, constitute a breach of that agreement. I'm not quite sure uh, why we ever thought we could negotiate with them. We also left out the, the government of Afghanistan, which I think caused them a great deal of uh, concern and obviously probably led to the precipitous fall of the government. But that is done, and uh, the decision to withdraw is also done. Yeah. I would have advocated to keep a residual force so we could maintain what we've, we've done together with yeah. our Afghan partners over the last 20 years. But we are where we are. So uh, it is to be determined what the relationship between the U.S. and the Taliban is. I think mm -hmm. they have a significant interest in continuing that with not just the United States but the West, as so much of their actual uh, economic input comes from the West. Uh, that they can't just uh, see that go away. Uh, one of the main conditions of the deal was that the Taliban did not allow uh, terrorist groups to stage attacks and plot against the United States on their soil. Um, do you think that they will, they will hold good to that point? Uh, no, I don't. I think, they're, uh, I think just about every terrorist element in the world right now is trying to get to Afghanistan. I think ISIS, the Khorasan, is going to be very active. I think al-Qaeda is going to be very active. And the Haqqani Network is a foreign te uh, terrorist-designated organization of which is now in Kabul, uh, and part of the Taliban leadership is uh, Sarah Haqqani. So uh, I think that's, that, that has already been determined, and the answer is no. Madiha, I um, just want to pick up on a point that was made a little earlier about uh, how you know, the ideology is the same, but we have more experience. That was uh, according to the Taliban spokesman. Um, what does that mean? Change or no change? I take that to mean no change. I take that to mean that essentially they still believe the things that they did in the 96-2001 timeframe when they were last in power. But what the experience part of it is, is that they have learned the art of political rhetoric. Uh, and that's what you see in the press conferences. And they have learned how to be vague. Um, so the, the words like inclusion, uh, saying that women will have all the rights, and then saying the very vague under Islamic law. Well, is it their interpretation of Islamic law as it was uh, in the 96, 2001 timeframe? It would seem so. And so mm. nothing's really, in my view, going to change. I think Taliban 2.0 is just the same 
as Taliban 1.0 with uh, the veneer of mm. rhetoric uh, designed to appease an international audience that is currently watching. Once it stops watching, what happens? Uh, we asked uh, Mick earlier if you think, if, if he thinks that uh, the Taliban is not abiding uh, by the Doha agreement, in particular, uh, the condition that they don't allow terrorist groups to uh, gather on their soil and, and stage attacks and plot and so on. I understand you believe that has already been breached and that the intelligence points in that direction. What are you referring to? Sure, I mean, we know from uh, intelligence reports, UN reports, that the Taliban has not cut ties with Al-Qaeda. The Taliban maintains ties with Al-Qaeda, and that was throughout uh, the time period that the Doha deal was basically in effect from uh, February 28th, um, uh, 2020, to now, uh, that has been the case. Um, uh, but. So, so that's the first thing. And I think there are other terrorist groups uh, on uh, Afghan soil that are going to cause the region a lot of concern. Uh, one uh, such group um, is the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan. Uh, and that is a group that is affiliated with the Afghan Taliban, though separate from it, and it attacks the Pakistani state. Uh, Pakistan um, is and should be very worried about where that's going to lead that country. Um, and we already know uh, reports that uh, TTP fighters have um, been released uh, from uh, prisons uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the, the Pakistanis are trying to figure out whether they can also engage in some sort of deal with the Afghan Taliban uh, to try to make sure that the TTP doesn't attack Pakistan from their soil. But I, I think any such deal is completely unlikely to be effective. Uh, you said that uh, if military technology uh, were to pass from the Afghan Taliban to the Pakistani Taliban, it would be disastrous for Pakistan. We have heard in recent days of the Americans leaving behind a lot of hardware. Uh, what in particular are you concerned about? I mean, I think, you know, uh, all uh, sort of uh, arms that are now in um, Afghan Taliban control, any sort of um, uh, indication that they may pass on to other terrorist groups, uh, other jihadist groups on Afghan soil is problematic for whoever uh, they might attack. If they pass on into anyone um, in the TTP, that is a problem, uh, certainly for Pakistan. If they pass somehow into ISIS-K hands or Al-Qaeda hands, again, uh, a problem for uh, those, those groups may attack. Um, so I think we should all be very concerned, of course, about the technology, military arms uh, that have passed into uh, Taliban hands. Right. Obedullah, uh, you have quite a complicated situation there in Kabul, uh, to put it mildly. Your family supports the Taliban, but you work at the American University of Afghanistan. Uh, what does the future hold for you? Look, the, this country is full of paradoxes. I mean, uh, if you look at the picture behind you of Zabiullah Mujahid, he's speaking at the government media center, uh, the same media center whose head the Taliban assassinated less than a month ago. Um, so, um, for me, Afghanistan is my home. It has always been my home, even when I was further away from it. Um, and now I'm back, and I don't want to give it up. I will lay claim to it. I think there is a, a need for people who um, are educated, who have seen the modern world, to sit down and have a conversation with the Taliban with regards to what world they plan on constructing. Look, your other guests actually talked about the question of legitimacy and how the Taliban were trying to appease the West. There is a logical um, issue here as well. Um, legitimacy, sovereignty is not seen as a right anymore. It's seen as responsibility. That means it can be taken back as well. So I don't understand, and maybe this is the optimist speaking within me, it's why the Taliban would want to appease the West now only to um, disregard their stances in the future. Um, so I think that the fact that they're saying these things, it's a good start. Uh, that means that there's some room to work with. Absolutely not in a completely ideal way, but at least we have some margin of negotiations. And the Herat University meeting of the Higher Education Commission of the Taliban was a good start because they sat down, they laid down their rules, they heard back arguments, and they said, okay, give us a counter proposal. So even if we can work with that, look, we lost the war. We lost the political high ground. Now they have all the cards. So the least we can do is try and push as much as we can and shake the bush for some sort of sustainable social order in this country. 
OK, so Saad was saying that he was very worried about the brain drain happening in Afghanistan right now. You're a lecturer at uh, the American University of Afghanistan. What do you think is going to happen to academics like yourself and others and your students, especially female students, um, in the coming months and years? Well, a few of my students were trying to be funny and they messaged me saying the Taliban would allow pious old men to teach uh, the female students. So they want me to gray out my beard and uh, try and uh, right. sneak into their classes to teach them. Um, but uh, jokes aside, uh, the reality of the matter is that a lot of my students are leaving the country. Uh, a lot of others in different institutions don't think that they will have a future um, in academia either. Some wanted to be lecturers, they had dreams. Um, and they find it difficult to uh, think that there is any future for them uh, there. Um, again, uh, I guess the education system will move ahead. There will be some sort of segregation. Um, I hope that there is some sense with regards to uh, letting male teachers, which obviously are the more abundant bunch, to teach those female students um, to have access to them. And then the world has evolved, so it can all be online, even if the students can't sit physically with the teacher, they can have them online. They don't need to turn their cameras on. So these are right. all sorts of conversations that might sound silly, but they need to, to be had. OK, I just want to uh, turn to Ahmed Massoud now, very interesting character out in Afghanistan. You know, Barada poised uh, to be Afghanistan's next leader, many people are saying, um, taken pretty much the entire country. That one well-known Afghan figure who's resisting, Ahmed Massoud. Um, he's the founder of the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan, the son of the legendary Mujahideen fighter Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, who fought the Soviets uh, and he fought the Taliban and was eventually assassinated. Um, well, following in his footsteps, Massoud leads the resistance in the Panjshir Valley. And like the Taliban knows the value of PR, he's written an appeal in the Washington Post. There's a couple of quotes from him. Uh, we need more weapons more ammunition, more supplies. Uh, there is still much that you, meaning the, the foreign audience uh, who are reading this, uh, can do to aid the cause of freedom. You are our remaining hope. Um, Saad, what can you tell me uh, about this man and what can you tell me about his chances of resisting the Taliban? Well, I think, I believe he has about 5,000 troops uh, in, in Panjshir, which is a, a pretty strategically... Uh, situated valley, hard to get to and, and easy to defend. Uh, but uh, he's surrounded by the enemy. Uh, unlike his father, who uh, basically had access to Central Asia, the Panjshir is pretty pretty isolated right now. Uh, but they are. But I also know that they're in discussions uh, with the Taliban. And I think all sides would like to resolve this peacefully, if possible. Um, you know, you, you hear there is some saber rattling on both sides, but the hope is that you know that we don't see a full-on war where uh, mm. civilians get killed, and uh, there are a lot of vulnerable people inside that valley. Uh, so, from what I understand, uh, they've sent delegations back and forth to see if they can resolve this. We haven't seen any fighting, uh, uh, you know, in, in Panjshir or on, on the uh, outskirts of Panjshir as yet. Mm. Uh, Mick, just a, a final question. Uh, he obviously comes from a family of fighters. Tell us a bit more about his background. So, as many of your listeners might know, we had a relationship with him that actually was the, I think, the genesis of our invasion after September 11, 2001, when we went back and, and organized with the Northern Alliance to topple the Taliban. So, uh, his father, of course, uh, has uh, had that relationship. Uh, I don't know much about this. A person. Uh, uh, do you think the United States? I think he does have a, do, do you think the United States would, in any way, give him support? So I actually just wrote an article uh, for Time Magazine with my colleague uh, Bilal Saab at the Middle East Institute, where we advocate for uh, maintaining uh, or, or gaining a relationship uh, with him and keeping a a presence up there, because quite frankly, uh, our counterterrorism threat. Um, has just increased astronomically. And if we don't have the ability to collect information on that, we can't mitigate it. So um, we can either do that from outside of the country, which is very difficult, 
or inside of the country. And I, I would agree that the Panjshir, and I've been there many times, uh, is difficult to get to, uh, but it's better than not being there at all. So we advocate for that. I don't know if that's going to be the plan, if this administration is doing it. Um, and then, and and whether they will supply them with uh, with weapons, also, I, I have no idea. Well, but I would advocate that they at least maintain a relationship with them, so that we can at least collect the intelligence that we need to to understand the threat picture. Well, see what happens. Mick Mulroy, Obedullah Bahir, Madihir Afsal, and Saad Museni, thank you all very much for your contributions to the Nexus today, and thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus. TRT World. Until next week then, goodbye.